would you feel if you suddenly realized that you don't remember a third of your life? You remember your childhood well. You remember the last couple of years very well. But you don't remember a huge part of your life in the middle. You can't remember a single event. Where did you live all that time? Where did you go? What joys and sorrows did you experience? Nothing. Resentment, embarrassment, confusion, panic. It's hard to imagine the emotions that would fill any one of us. And now imagine that such a fact exists on the scale of an entire planet. Our planet. Did you know that about a quarter of the Earth's geologic history is just missing? It's not that we can't find evidence. It's that the evidence just doesn't exist, physically. This is not a joke or an exaggeration or a conspiracy. It's a scientific fact that has an equally mysterious name. The Great Unconformity. Today, you will learn where and why did a 14-kilometer layer of soil disappear without a trace across the planet? What is the connection between the Grand Canyon and the mountain ranges in Australia? How did the deadliest winter in the history of the planet become the cradle of vibrant life? Who turned off the Earth's magnetic field 500 million years ago? We're off to explore the mysteries of the grandest events in the planetary history. The mystery of the Great Unconformity. It all began in 1869 when a prominent American geologist, John Wesley Powell, a professor at Illinois Wesleyan University, went on an expedition to the Grand Canyon. That trip made Powell a devoted fan of this amazing geological formation. The canyon impressed him so much that the scientists called it the Library of the Gods. Why the library? Because the Grand Canyon is an inexhaustible reservoir of knowledge about the past of our planet for any geologist. The work of a geologist can be compared to digging in a puff pastry. Each new layer reveals to us the secrets of distant times. And the further we want to look into the past, the deeper into the ground we have to dig. The Grand Canyon is a real jackpot for any geologist. That's because you don't even have to dig here. The Earth's geological history is spread here before your eyes. And the depth of the canyon allows you to look billions of years into the past. Amazing knowledge about the atmosphere, water and life has remained imprinted in the layers of the rock. That's why Powell called this place the Library of the Gods. You might admit there's even a certain visual resemblance in these layers to stacks of books when viewed from the side. And this natural multi-volume encyclopedia contains about 40% of the geological history of our planet. Yet there was an unexpected surprise waiting for the eager scientist here. Powell never imagined that this gigantic library would give him more questions than answers. And they would be fundamental questions, ruthless in their bluntness and even a little frightening. Powell discovered a strange unconformity. By all the laws of geology, if you compare the oldest rocks at the bottom of the Grand Canyon with the age of the Earth, the height of the chasm should be greater, much, much greater than what the scientists had actually seen. What's wrong? Is there a mistake somewhere in the calculations? No, there isn't. There was nothing wrong with their calculations. What was wrong was the sedimentary rocks themselves, which just were not there where they were supposed to be. In 1880, another prominent geologist, Clarence Dutton, continued his colleague's work and conducted a much more detailed study. He discovered that some of the lowest layers of the rock deep in the canyon were inclined towards the upper layers. Dutton knew for sure that these inclined layers consisted of very ancient deposits. Originally, they were deposited as horizontal strata, mostly in rivers and other bodies of water. Then over time, the sediments hardened and geologic forces pushed some layers upwards at an angle. Later, the sharp edges of these angled layers were cut away by erosion. And later, new layers of sedimentary rock that remained more or less horizontal were deposited right on top of them. Dutton understood clearly that each stage of this process took a very long time. 
and the horizontal layers simply could not naturally overlap the inclined ones unless there was a big difference in age between them. Here we have the following situation. The oldest rock samples are almost 2 billion years old. The younger ones are about 500 to 550 million years old, but they sit on top of each other. Directly, there are simply no rocks in between. No one can find an intermediate layer that is a billion years old or say 900 million years old. There are only super old ones followed by super young ones. There are also other unconformities found in the canyon. There are 175 million years here, 500 million years there, or even 725 million years erased from the rocks. This is a clear and very strange gap in geological history. Thanks to Dutton and Powell, this strange unconformity has become the great unconformity for the scientific world. Unconformity because the rocks at the bottom were really old and the rocks at the top were so much younger. And it was called great because in the middle there were rocks missing from nearly a third of Earth's history. And although both great scientists realized the significance of their discovery, at that time they couldn't imagine that even nearly 150 years later, their followers would still be locking horns in heated scientific debates about the causes of the phenomenon. Indeed, it soon became clear that the great unconformity was not just a Grand Canyon's issue. Evidence that the phenomenon affects the entire planet came thick and fast. It turns out that the same process was observed 100 years before Powell and Dutton by another scientist, James Hutton, but in faraway Scotland at Sikar Point in the Great Glen Fault. Though he had different ages and the scale of the problem. But at Frenchman Mountain, east of Las Vegas, the situation was exactly the same as at the Grand Canyon. There, rocks of 1.7 billion years of age easily neighbors those of 520 million years of age. It's also unclear what happened to the rock in the middle. Tourists are now invited to take a special route to see the place where a quarter of the Earth's history vanished. But there is more to come. West of the United States, signs of the Great Unconformity have been found in such places as Zion National Park in Utah and Glacier National Park in Montana, Canadian Rocky Mountains, the Great Unconformity is found in Banff National Park and Jasper National Park in Alberta. A number of places where ancient Precambrian rocks and overlying Paleozoic sedimentary rocks do not fit together. Brazil, it is all the same. Some places were found in the Brazilian highlands where ancient Precambrian crystalline rocks are overlapped by sedimentary layers of the Paleozoic era. Australia. Various regions of the southern continent show signs of the Great Unconformity. For example, the Flinders Ranges and McDonnell Ranges. And these are just a few examples of such places. And in fact, significant unconformities are found in many geological regions of the world, representing extremely strange gaps in the geological record of the planet. More and more scientists incline to this point of view. For example, Stefan Marshak, a professor at the University of Illinois, states directly that such unconformities exist everywhere on Earth. The Grand Canyon and other places with a similar relief just show us the most obvious visible evidence, which is literally an eyesore to astonished scientists. Somewhere in Europe, in order to get to the layers of such an age, one must drill several kilometers in depth. But Stefan virtually assures us that if we set a goal and drill that deep anywhere, we'll meet exactly the same. The stones with an age difference of more than a billion years will lie on top of each other. In total, there are 10 billion cubic kilometers of soil which just disappeared. Where has it gone? Let's play the skeptical pragmatists and assume it didn't exist at all. But that would be nothing more than an attempt to bury our heads in the sand because the problem itself won't disappear. Such a gigantic amount of incomprehensibly disappeared deposits reflects an equally gigantic amount of unrecorded time. Almost a quarter of the Earth's history. As if some invisible powerful force just paused time itself and after a billion years started everything again from scratch. Well, almost from scratch. 
Here, even the most persistent skeptic would hesitate and begin to speculate the most crazy conspiracy theories. Needless to say, it became a matter of honor and principle for the scientists to find out what really happened. And the most interesting is that the Great Unconformity almost mysteriously coincides with three key events in the history of the Earth. First, this is the Cambrian Explosion. It is in itself a mystery to mankind. The point is that for billions of years of Earth's early history, life on our planet was very sparse. Not to say poor in terms of diversity. But about 542 million years ago, the planet literally exploded. From that point on, there was a dramatic increase in the number of species of living creatures, which in addition became much more diverse began to develop a skeleton and actively hunted each other. From the moment of the Cambrian explosion, the Earth formed, give or take, the laws of nature we still live by today. Of course, all this didn't happen overnight and the process took millions of years. But what is important for us is that this process, by an interesting coincidence, happened just after the end of the Great Unconformity. It was then that the geological deposits returned as if someone took history off the pause. The second coincidence is a dramatic weakening of the Earth's magnetic field. A study by geologists at the University of Rochester found evidence of a significant weakening of the Earth's magnetic field about 565 million years ago, lasting about 5 million years. To get this information, researchers studied ancient volcanic rocks from Canada and Australia. These rocks contain tiny particles of magnetic materials that literally recorded the strength and orientation of the Earth's magnetic field at the time of their formation. By analyzing the rock's magnetic properties, the researchers were able to rebuild the behavior of the magnetic field in the past. The results showed that the Earth's magnetic field at the time was only about 10% of its current strength. This is insanely low. Solar radiation was piercing everything alive like a knife cutting butter. Magnetic field activity is directly related to the iron core of our planet, and there was probably something strange going on with it in that era. But even stranger, the magnetic field was back to normal just about the time of the Cambrian explosion of life. The exact cause of the dramatic weakening of the magnetic field remains unclear. Researchers suggest that it may be due to complex interactions between the Earth's core and mantle, as well as the influence of geological processes such as plate tectonics. You might agree that this is not a very good explanation. Finally, the third coincidence is the first major animal extinction. The Ediacaran biota, which lived almost immediately before the Cambrian explosion, became 80% extinct some 540 to 550 million years ago. Researchers from Virginia Polytechnic University, in a very recent study from November 2022, boldly stated that literally everything and everywhere on Earth went extinct regardless of habitat. But what exactly happened and why is not clear as usual. Aren't there too many coincidences? Common sense suggests that all these apocal events are somehow interrelated, but how? And what place does the Great Unconformity have in this? Is it a reflection of some titanic process that led to all of these cataclysms? It's important not to take harsh statements and not to hurry in this issue, and scientists are trying their best to keep a clear mind step by step, building hypotheses of the causes of all these strange things on a planetary scale. And the only thing they can resort to in literal and figurative sense is the manifestations of the Great Unconformity. Its causes are attributed either to global glaciation or to the movements of continents or even to the aforementioned temporary disappearance of the Earth's magnetic field. But so far, none of the hypotheses has gained enough authority to be considered the main one. Of course, there are also some quite fantastic, not to say ridiculous theories. Aliens, Matrix, Earth Terrarium, and so on. But they are put forward not by scientists, as one can easily guess. And if we leave only the purely scientific approach, then in fact we are left with only two options. Either something which is still unknown for us made it so that virtually no new sediments were deposited for hundreds of millions of years, 
or some other unknown thing has caused a sudden, rapid and powerful erosion on a planetary scale which destroyed the geological record. The most credible theories of the causes of the Great Unconformity are based on these two grounds. In an article published in the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, scientists provide very convincing evidence that glaciers caused the disappearance of sediments across the planet. This assumption is built according to an interesting, quite popular in scientific circles and also quite convincing theory with the funny name Snowball Earth. It claims that the Earth was completely covered with ice in part of the Cryogenic and Ediacaran periods of the Neoproterozoic Era and possibly in other geological eras as well. According to this version, it's the massive glaciers that have literally peeled off, scraped off a layer of rock with a thickness of more than a dozen kilometers from the surface of the planet. After all, glaciers move, pulling the soil away with them. An international research team noticed tiny crystals of a mineral called zircon, not to be confused with the metal zirconium, which is only part of zircon along with silicon and oxygen. Zircon is one of the first solids to be formed when molten liquid rocks, i.e. magma, cool down. And it's a very hard material. It can be preserved in the form of large fractions even after very destructive geological processes that turn other minerals into fine dust. And what's even more important, this mineral can capture in itself the surrounding geochemical conditions right at the moment of their own formation. Scientists have long learned to date these crystals by the presence of isotopes of uranium, a radioactive element that decays very, very slowly. In this study, the team also investigated the oxygen and hafnium metal isotopes in zircon crystals. Their ratios vary widely between the continental crust that forms the land and the oceanic crust that forms the seabed. This is how scientists understand whether a particular part made a significant contribution to the magma from which the zircon crystals formed. A total of about 30,000 crystals were studied, and this is what the results showed. A layer of as much as 14 vertical kilometers apparently was literally peeled off the entire land surface of the planet, then dumped into the oceans. Then all this matter went underground and was converted into magma by a process of subduction. This fits well with the idea that about 650 million years ago, the entire planet, or most of it, was completely covered with ice. And the researchers supplemented this proof by examining ancient impact craters. They noted that there should be more intact craters after the global glaciation than before it because massive ice sheets must have been scraped off smaller craters in exactly the same way. Indeed, there are many known places where cosmic guests, large meteorites and asteroids, collided with the planet from the Cambrian period onwards. But so far, the scientists managed to find very few craters formed before the Cambrian, and those that exist are all at great depths. Combined with the data on zircon crystals, this proves very convincingly that giant glaciers were indeed very intensively destroying the land surface about 650 million years ago. It would seem that the question is solved. Well, it is not. This coherent theory is not devoid of blank spaces and very noticeable ones. One of the most trickiest problems of the theory is that, by all indications, the Earth should have already warmed up sufficiently in the millions of years before the formation of the Great Unconformity ended. And it is completely unclear why there are no layers of sediments belonging to this conventionally transitional period. The authors of the study make some pretty desperate assumptions. According to their version, the ice might simply leave nothing left after itself. That is, to scrape off the entire land from the planet and flush it into the ocean like a sinkhole. And then it took a long time to form new land, literally from scratch. But again, the assumption is pretty desperate and the authors of the study admit that more data is needed to confirm it. Against the background of the gaps in the glacial version of the Great Unconformity, another theory is gaining ground. It is based on the history of formation and breakup of the supercontinent Rodinia. It should be noted that this theory doesn't deny the hypothesis of the snowball Earth. 
On the contrary, it rather confirms it and agrees well with it. However, it offers other reasons for the great unconformity. Let us briefly explain the essence. According to the Snowball Earth idea, glaciers once covered all or most of the Earth's surface from the poles to the equator, and this may have happened more than once in the late Proterozoic. There may well have been several episodes of Snowball Earth. The first started about 716 million years ago, and the last one ended just 635 million years ago. And these cold periods are surely related to the Great Unconformity. But it is a big question how exactly they are related to it. And different scientists will give different answers to it. Either the Snowball Earth was the cause of the formation of the Great Unconformity which we've just outlined, or the Great Unconformity was part of the process that caused the Snowball Earth. One study published in 2018 gives us a different perspective. It examined the Ozark Plateau in North America where 500 million year old Cambrian sandstones lies on top of 1.4 billion year old granite. Here, as in the Grand Canyon, the Great Unconformity is clearly visible. Uranium and helium isotopes trapped in zircon crystals were used for dating too. Researchers found that this area was subject to tectonic uplift and erosion about 850 to 680 million years ago. This coincides with the breakup of the supercontinent Rodinia. As a reminder, a supercontinent is a continent containing all, or almost all, of the planet's land. So tectonic uplift on a large scale may be a side effect of the supercontinent's breakup. According to the authors of the study, several vertical kilometers of rock have been raised up and then destroyed by erosion. Because the Ozark Plateau was deep inland at the time, scientists suspect that large-scale erosion affected the entire continent. Then, the parts of Rodinia diverged into different parts of the planet. Then they converged as many as three or more times into new generations of supercontinents. Pinocchio, Gondwana and Pangaea. The latter has then broken up into easily recognizable continents we see on maps. But the legacy of the large-scale erosion during the Rodinia era did not disappear and waited for its discoverers Powell and Dutton. And that's not all. Do you remember that we said that according to one version, the great unconformity in the Snowball Earth were caused by the same process? Well, the authors of the study believe that the erosion of all those Proterozoic rocks had a very dramatic impact on the climate. Namely, huge amounts of carbon in the land and oceans were bound up by chemical reactions and didn't make it into the atmosphere. This is because rainwater often removes carbon from the atmosphere during weathering. Because rainwater is mildly acidic, it dissolves rock slowly but surely and releases carbon ions. The free ions enter the ocean, where they form calcium carbonate, simple chalk. It eventually settles down in the ocean and accumulates in huge quantities, trapping the carbon in the rock. And carbon is a key component of greenhouse gases. The less carbon in the atmosphere, the less greenhouse gases, the less heat is retained. The balance is broken, and here we are. Welcome to the Snowball Earth. Everything is consistent, logical, and convincing here too. So who's right? As we have already mentioned, neither theory has yet gained enough ground to be considered the main one. There are significant inconsistencies in both of them. We won't go deep into these details, it's enough to know that they do exist. Instead, we'll need to recall the mysterious coincidences that accompany the Great Unconformity problem. As for the catastrophic weakening of the Earth's magnetic field during that period, the connection can be traced very faintly here so far. Scientists frankly throw up their hands. Perhaps this is really just a coincidence, why not? And as for the Cambrian explosion, the connection is not so ghostly. In some cases, it's even obvious. First, on a purely logical level, the loss of such a gigantic volume of land could not help but affect the nature of life on the planet. Complex life did change dramatically during the Ediacaran period, which ended the Proterozoic. And then something incredible happened during the Cambrian. Life took on forms and colors that our planet would never have dreamed of, had it been able to dream. 
Scientists suggest that when the entire landmass was destroyed, it radically changed the chemical composition of the ocean. And it doesn't matter for what reason. Erosion and weathering or glaciers rolled over the land like bulldozers. What matters is the result. And the result is the same. Huge volumes of geological material moved from the land to the sea. As a result, the oceans were filled with calcium, potassium, iron, phosphorus and other vital elements. This might be exactly the thing that revolutionized our planet's biosphere, giving it the chemical building blocks necessary for the development of complex life forms. One hypothesis even suggests that these new ingredients contributed to biomineralization, the process in which living creatures build minerals for their shells and skeletons. Researchers note that in addition to adding minerals to the water, the depressions left by glaciers may have been filled in and became fertile shallow seas where sea life forms could flourish. However, they too are skeptical of this hypothesis because their research lacks direct evidence for it. But why not? Because there is something very symbolic in the fact that the harshest winter in the history of the planet was the trigger for the incredible flourishing of life in all the scenic splendor as we see now. And the manifestations of the great unconformity are just another reminder of how long, difficult and even tragic was the evolutionary path that nature took from the most primitive unicellular organisms to you and me.